Hello, and welcome to our Education with Industry Roundtable. I'm Bruce Litchfield, Vice President for Sustainment Operations at Lockheed Martin Aeronautics. And today, we're going to talk to our two Air Force officer candidates for, in the Education with Industry program for this year. And let me let them introduce themselves to you now. Captain Clark? Thanks, Bruce. Um, I'm Captain Kira Clark, United States Air Force Logistics Readiness Officer. I've been in for six years. My logistics background includes material management, fuels management, aerial port operations, and deployment plans and operations. Here at Lockheed, I've been assigned to the deployment support team, so I'm able to capitalize on my experience um, in working under supply and having that deployment experience. So Kara, you've done an awful lot in a short career. Uh, is that normal? Yes, Bruce, they like to broaden us logistics officers so that we're able to do a program like education with industry, having knowledge that we can bring to the industry so they don't want anybody too specific on one thing. Uh, we know a lot to really tie in the logistics network. And, and where'd you come from? I came from Osan Air Base, Korea. Wow, and that, that's uh, quite a ways from here. Absolutely, yep. And, and do you know where your follow-on assignment's going to be? I do, I have a follow-on assignment to ACCA4 at Langley Air Force Base. How exciting. I'm very excited. Mitch. I'm Captain Mitch Prisbaki. I'm an aircraft maintenance officer. Uh, my background is Air Mobility Command and Air Force Special Operations Command. I have uh, experience overseeing maintenance units, both uh, back shop and flight line maintenance for uh, C-130s, uh, soft modified C-130s, CV-22, rotary wing platform, C-5s, and KC-10 tanker units. I uh, commanded a small maintenance uh, squadron in Afghanistan uh, part of a joint uh, special operations task force where we were pretty much busy every single night and uh, then came here most recently from Herbert Field, Florida, sir. And Mitch, do you have a follow-on assignment? Uh, no official word yet, sir. I have uh, been told uh, possibly AFMC, uh, but something where we want to, the career fit wants to utilize F-35 experience uh, to leverage the next uh, next position. Well, Mitch, on a, on a serious note, and I I know I don't have the answer to your follow-on assignment, but I do uh, get feedback from the Air Force senior leaders at the general officer level that I know they have you on your radar scope, and they're really trying to balance your career with what, uh, what the program brings to you to make sure that when you go back to the Air Force, they take full advantage of it. And I think that's, that's really pretty impressive that you're being managed in that kind of way. So uh, let me start, uh, Mitch, while, while you are up. Um, what drew you to the Education with Industry program? Yes, sir. So um, since, uh, since I was a brand new maintenance lieutenant, uh, mentors had been talking about uh, career broadening opportunities, which a good target of opportunity is mid-level captain, third assignment, kind of like it is for both of us. Uh, so we had always been told about uh, logistics career broadening, um, elite, the acquisitions logistics uh, exchange program, uh, but recently gaining more momentum in our field had been the Education with Industry uh, Fellowship. Uh, educational industry is nothing new. It's been around since the inception of the Air Force in one shape or form. However, what was more so a uh, acquisitions and contracting role, we're now taking industry best practices to other career fields. So I actually had a Lois Symposium a few years ago. A friend of mine, she was in the program uh, doing her fellowship with Delta Airlines, and a lot of the lessons she was learning from industry, she was a maintenance officer, uh, as far as predictive analytics, uh, CBM Plus uh, type maintenance management, I wanted to take back to my tactical management of our a legacy C-130 fleet in AFSOC because obviously AFSOC, we had to have healthy aircraft on that ramp so we could go do our mission if we were called upon. Uh, so that got me curious about the program, sir, and just reaching out to more and more uh, folks the following year to Lowe's Symposium. I run into last year's uh, fellow here, Captain Will Fine, and he was a logistics officer by trait, but just talking about how much he was learning uh, at Lockheed Martin, especially being a defense contractor and how he was able to really see his role, sort of have a foot in industry door and a foot in, uh, in um, Air Force door and still learn a lot of lessons and, and just enhance that professional development. So it was a no-brainer to apply. Uh, so when the time came to apply for a, 
a career broadening opportunity, EOE was at the top of the list and thankfully we got selected. Absolutely, Mitch. It's a selective program. So to be chosen to be here, um, it's a great experience. And to know that we're getting that experience that not everybody gets, you know, this is a program where there's only five logistics officers this year in my entire uh, year group. So really being able to have a career broadening experience that this selective and um, it's just so different. It's that was the reason I wanted to apply. You know, you you talked um, very well and eloquently about why you joined the program. And, and I want to tell you from a, from my perspective and as Lockheed Martin and, and then as for statement operations perspective, we're grateful to have you here because you're bringing very much relevant, very, very much real time experience from the field to our team so that we can know how to better support the Air Force, better support the folks that are on the flight line making it happen 24-7, 365. And so it's a win-win. And, and when you look at a partnership, I can't think of a, a better way of kind of growing for the future, both from a Lockheed perspective, as well as from an Air Force perspective of what you can bring back. So, um, uh, Kara, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing while you've been in the program? Absolutely. So, like I mentioned, I'm on the deployment support team for the F-35. It's very similar to a supply and deployment mix in the Air Force. We not only work with the Air Force F-35As, but the B and C variants as well, and our in uh, international partners. So sometimes I'm on a phone call with Australia, sometimes on, I'm on a phone call with the U.S. Navy. It's a very diverse program and really getting the experience in that joint international um, partnership has been uh, an incredible experience that normally a junior captain wouldn't get. So day in, day out, I'm working with my team. Uh, it's way different than being a flight commander in a logistics career field. Uh, I don't have admin work. I don't have 1206s and OPRs, EPRs to do. I'm really grinding away with the team, which is quite a different experience than a normal captain would be getting on an active duty billet. So do you feel uh, as you uh, acclimated into the team, that you are a team member or they treat you differently or, or you feel you're a valuable part of that team in, in the way you execute? I absolutely feel like part of the team. Um, people call me Kira at work and that's just not something we get in the Air Force. Uh, call me up, hey, Kira, what do you think about this? I'd like to bounce your perspective, your experience. Hey, maybe can you help me with this? And that's not normally something um, I get phone calls about on a normal Air Force, like I said, job billet. That's good. Mm -hmm. Mitch, what, what have you been uh, doing while you've been here and, and how have you been acclimated into the team? Yes, sir. So much like you, we've said goodbye to our, you know, our airmen, our, our rank structure, uh, everything that you love most about the job and frankly does matter most. Uh, but some of those phone calls at night, you're not getting <laughs> anymore. So 100% of my focus has been, whether it was EWI academic or, or EWI networking, actual task within the Keep Them Flying Agile cell. Uh, so the Keep Them Flying Agile cell operates with uh, sprint planning, which uh, comes out of software development around the early 2000s time frame. And it's not uncommon to see that across industry as we've seen other mid tour briefs from other career fields. Uh, so basically we do our sprint planning where we have a daily tag up. Unfortunately, a lot of it's virtual, but we have a daily tag up called the scrum session where that scrum master drives the meeting uh, and make, make sure all members have their, their tasks and their workload done. So to an answer your, your question exactly with the work, sir, a lot of it has just been certain projects to help the F-35 uh, be more effectively sustained. Our, our goal is to drive down future ARs. Uh, for anyone that's watching not F-35 familiar, AR is your action request. And we get a lot of that uh, request for assistance from the field, not only U.S. Air Force, but our partner nations, Marines, Navy. And uh, kind of like you alluded to with some of the partners, uh, seeing an Australian have an F-35 um, a need for an AR fairly recently. One of our projects was to help monitor uh, the solution to that point. Obviously, there's going to be whether there's a buyer or not for the solution we propose, but we have a solution in which would retrofit uh, the certain aspect, which I won't go into. Uh, but we work that so the KEF exists to shatter the silo, reach across your barrier, make sure there's no bureaucracy uh, because the team member that was a slickum that was monitoring the, the solution. Uh, that we want to request a modification retrofit mod for the aircraft. He needed some, um, I guess you could say, some more velocity behind his, his punches. And that's where the Keflet cell existed. So we can make phone calls, send emails, and say, hey, 
I'm Mitch Przybocki. I usually do introduce that, hey, I'm the Ewe Fellow, so they know why they see that it does a signature block. But say, hey, I'm working in the KEF, CC my boss in the KEF and say, hey, we want to help with this issue. And then you find that some of the bureaucracy is now shattered. There's less silos, so we're able to reach across different organizations, whether it's engineers, whether it's sustainment lifecycle managers, we can help expedite the process of trying to create a solution to help our warfighter. Because at the end of the day, those are the maintainers that I could be leading, your logisticians you could be leading. And if they have to, they're expected to keep these aircraft in a combat capable status, we owe it to them to fix. And I've seen my teammates at Lockheed Martin really work hard to fix that. And, and you feel that your input has been valued and been able to uh, drive the team and, and really make improvements to, to support the field? Absolutely, sir. So because of the large veteran presence on our team, even though I said, hey, call me Mitch, the whole point is to embed with industry, I'd say about half the team still calls me captain, uh, the <laughs> folks that wore the uniform. Uh, so it's about half the team. Uh, so they'll go on a meeting and they'll say, say the captain's maintainers in the field. They try to put themselves in that shoe, in, in their shoes. They put themselves in the maintainer's shoes. They don't forget that the flight line is their center of gravity, as I know it's, uh, that's how we say around here. Uh, but they're always trying to put us in their, their shoes, or excuse me, put themselves in the maintainer's shoe. And they'll say, say the captain's guys, or, or Mitch, what would the field do about this? And uh, there's areas I've seen from our, our process where I know the field can do better. Sure, we know industry's working to get better. Um, but it's definitely cool to see both ends of the perspective. And they have listened and asked those questions, sir, for our input. So, so Mitch, you brought it up. Um, and when you came in, you learned that one of our central focuses for sustainment is to be use the flight line as a center of gravity. And, 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 and I guess I would like to ask you, how have you seen that play out? Do, you know, when, when I talk about the flight line as a center of gravity, I mean that the impact has to be uh, to the maintainers, the sustainers, the LROs out on the flight line have what they need, when they need it, where they need it to be able to generate the force. Can you, have you seen that come to life? And, and if so, how? I absolutely have seen it. I came in, obviously, just wanted to learn as much as possible, be a metaphorical sponge when you start a program like this. And obviously going to the defense contractor, knowing, hey, I'm an Air Force captain, you honestly wonder what is the relationship, what is working. Um, you see pretty early that there's men and women working very hard to try to get those solutions. So some of the exact examples are, they talk about what happens in the control center, or this came up last night, or hey, there's an AR for this. And that's not necessarily was the catch role, that's more of the, the sustaining engineering side, which I'm getting the opportunity to set, shadow a little bit. But just the expedience and seriousness, they take issues in the field is one way I see us uh, do that. I'm uh, making sure we have accurate data when it goes to combing through ARs. So the team I've spent most of my time with, that KEF Agile cell, we want to drive down the future AR requests, right? So if you're looking at, at a list, you could have a laundry list of what this AR was submitted for. Is it info only? Is it this? Is it that? So making sure we have the answer right, knowing that we're actually answering the correct AR or something that can be driven down to help the maintainer. Um, don't know how much with the proprietary right, but one of the maintenance plan changes we've worked on is just the standardized procedures uh, for maintainers in the field. So when they go into their JTD, their joint tech data, they're able to have an easier job performing that task. Uh, I will say all the meetings, whether they've been virtual or in person, people are thinking about the maintainer and how easy they can perform that task. So everything we try to propose is end user focused. So it sounds like to me that the team is really wrapped around increasing performance, driving efficiency into the field and enabling self-sufficiency is, is really what you're describing. Does that make sense to you? I, I would just, yes, sir. And actually, as we talk about the EWE capstone, we owe a thesis at the end of this, agile organizations are sort of the focus of my capstone because I think the agile structure we have at Lockheed Martin allows us to be self-sustaining, worry about performance, and of course, shatter that silo. Uh, so again, came in pretty skeptical at the end of August, beginning of, of, of September. And I don't know if skeptical is the right word, but when you're a maintenance captain, you're joining uh, the, the contractor for the first time, you're just wondering what everything's gonna be. And then you see the KEF actually exist and operate like an organism as an agile organization should. Tons of academic literature on that. I, I'm a believer and I think they hit all the objectives you outlined, sir, because of the way they're, con they're, they're, they're set up in their construct. Kara, yeah. you are, uh, I would say, making sure that the field has what they need when they need it. 
And, and for you, how have you seen that play out and, and what have you been able to do to help uh, support the field and, and the flight line as the center of gravity? Absolutely, Bruce. We talk with those field service reps. We talk with the military members daily. We tag up multiple meetings, whether it's the actual military member or that site lead, to make sure they have everything they need. And if they don't, we are digging in the weeds to figure out what we can. Is it a Lockheed? Can it be resolved at Lockheed? Can it be resolved at the Air Force level? Where is it in between that we can help come to that resolution? Every day there's something new, but every day they're making the process better. Um, a Lockheed Martin success is an Air Force success. An Air Force success is a Lockheed Martin success, and I see that daily. My team members are driven. They want to see the Air Force, the military as a whole, our international partners do well because it's what drives them to, it makes them happy at work. You know, it's a great place to be around when things are getting done right and on time and faster and within budget. So you, we want to make sure this is one team, one fight here. So uh, Kara, having been around the sustainment business quite a bit, it doesn't always go perfect. And no. <laughs> it's, and sometimes there's just stuff that happens that makes it hard for the folks in the field to go do it. When you find a constraint or you find a problem, uh, can you, are you able to generate the, the energy and, and I think the momentum to fix those problems and get attention where it needs to be? Absolutely. Being in this critical position as an EWE fellow, um, we have the attention of the Air Force, we have the attention of Lockheed members such as yourself, Bruce, to really help connect the dots. Um, we, I wouldn't say we can fix everything, yeah. but when we do talk to people, and as Mitch, Mitch mentioned, uh, we say, hey, I'm an EWE fellow, and this is what I'm here to do. I, I'm here for these 10 months because I wanna help solve these problems. I can grab over here and tie it into over here. Um, and that's been really the best probably aspect of this is being that middle person to help connect the dots and communicate and really tie everybody together. So you're about uh, a little over halfway through with your program. Do you have any thing that you would say, these are my takeaways so far that uh, I've learned and, and I'm, you know, it's something I hadn't expected from the program? Yeah, one of them is uh, Lockheed Martin really knows how to keep a meeting in that exact hour. <laughs> 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 I, we, we need to take that back to the Air Force. Um, no, but really we have desired learning objectives that our career fields assigned us. So supply, transportation, human resources, we've been learning of those aspects, but um, it's just overall, it's the culture and just working with people, really able to help take that back. Most times in an Air Force career, if I do 20 years, I won't be able to wear a jacket like this. And so right. um, being able to kind of cross over and see things in a different light is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Mitch, what, what, have, uh, what have you learned, uh, your takeaways uh, for the program so far? Walking away, I thought maybe it would be technology because of the company we are. I thought it'd be Lockheed Martin, right? We're cutting edge uh, engineers and, and developers, uh, but it was actually this agile organizational structure. And I put it as a human capital, I would say it's probably the desired learning objective it falls under. And that's probably been my biggest takeaway because sure, e even though these meetings might be to the T on the schedule, I've been around meetings where people are, you know, cussing and discussing how to solve problems. I've seen people talk about, hey, maintenance in the field, a lot of observations from our, our control center here in Fort Worth. Reminds me of any maintenance meeting I've sat out in my entire career so far, uh, where you get the status of the aircraft and what do you need to get that jet fixed. But the biggest takeaway has been how the agile structure is set up and how our sprint planning and scrum management could be applied at a tactical uh, managerial level as an Air Force logistician. Uh, I'll cite the flying schedule for tw the 21As. If you have most commands set up where they do weekly f flying schedules, so you should know what your schedule is if you're really good and trying to predict it, you can predict months and month, months out, right? So we, we got there a little bit in AFSOC. But if you manage your schedule correctly and you have the key players in the room, the key players know when to, to, to speak and who you're actually inviting to the table, so to speak, that's what scrum planning and, and excuse me, sprint planning and scrum management can get out of that. Uh, because everybody's responsible for their own backlog. They drive their own work, whether it's, hey, here's a delayed discrepancy on an aircraft or here's a PM avionics system I need to go troubleshoot, you actually plan when you're going to do it. So that's been a big takeaway from the sort of blocking and tackling level, sir. But overall, the agile structure, I think really does put leadership in the center and allow all members to feel inclusive. So what are we talking about in our Air Force right now? It, making sure everyone has the right representation and, and everybody has a seat, some representation at their table. Agile can do that, and I was a believer of the Kefsel because it was such a cross-functional team, whether it was engineers, 
um, you know, R&M, maintenance, supply. So we definitely had a vast, uh, uh, a wide breadth of experience on that team. Okay, I'm going to change it up a bit, a little bit. And, and I'm sure that while you've been here, you've had some of your buds call you up and, and ask you, you know, what are you doing and, and what's the program? So what, what, are, what do they ask you? And, uh, and how do you answer them in terms of this program from, from your buds in the field? Well, if a bud asked me what they can do differently or asked why their uh, AR requests take so long, I can speak to the different layers they have to go through, how it's set up uh, with our uh, sustaining engineering team uh, here, here at Lockheed Martin. But I would say what the field can do different, this is for the F-35 gurus out there, get your LCN on there. Don't get your, it's like a work unit code uh, on an old aircraft. I've seen every AR I've, I've looked at with the team hasn't had the LCN, and it just adds extra time for us. So that's something the field can do better. But to be honest with you, sir, and so, sort of the reason we want to be advocates for this program and to continue to share the wealth and, and how much we've been able to develop even outside of a traditional Air Force uh, role, not a lot of people are reaching out, uh, at least for me, that I expected to. I figured, hey, we're a small enough community Maybe an F-35 officer would call up and say, hey, what are you doing, Mitch? But I find we reach out to them from our thing. Hey, what are you noticing? What are you noticing? And sure, you get the feedback, how, the feedback how well it is at the field at, at Luke Air Force Base with our Lockheed Martin um, uh, maintainers there doing that uh, uh, nose-to-tail maintenance. But not a lot of, there's been less questions about what we're doing at Lockheed Martin versus, hey, what's the experience like? And we answer honestly every time just like this, be like, it's really good. You see it from both sides and it's a great developmental opportunity. I w will say, I know you're probably going to talk about our trip to Nellis, but when we went to Nellis uh, to see some of our field operations there, we did sit down with uh, the local LOA chapter, the Blackjacks, and uh, their, their deputy asked a lot of questions about what we were doing and that kind of thing, reasonably so, because it's, it's their jets that they're responsible for in the line and we were able to speak to especially on the supply side for the deployment preps. But definitely I was able to talk about ARs. And when I explained some of the ARs, you saw some light bulbs go off across the room, some of the other CGOs that might have been sitting against the wall, like, oh, that's why it takes long. So can we get better on, on the LM side? Of course. But can the field get better too with that LCN input? Yes. So we got to keep working both ends of the partnership, sir. Very good. Kara, you, you've been contacted and, and asked? I definitely had some friends reach out and, you know, hey, have you heard this Air Force news? Because it does feel a little like we're removed from the Air Force world sometimes. So it's nice to have your friends tag up with you and, and make sure you're getting the latest info. But at the same time, we st still feel so involved because we work day in, day out with the Air Force and the military as a whole. Um, but my friends that reach out, they're excited to hear about my experience. I've had some junior officers say, hey, how did you apply for EWI? Um, and I love to share that information because I think it's a great program. And the more people we can get involved in it, the better. Uh, great. So. Um in terms of the future, uh, you know, the lessons that you've learned here, are, are you excited about maybe uh, not just the technical aspects about this, but talk about growing of the partnership and, and what you've learned that maybe you can help in terms of bridging that gap between industry and, and the Air Force in terms of how we can be better together. Anything that you were going to take from that? Well, absolutely. With me going to a staff position next, I think I'll really be able to capitalize on the network I've met here um, and just knowing who to reach back to. Like I said, everybody here, we it's one team, one fight. It's a success for everybody when something goes well. So we want to continue this partnership. Um, I've you know, even though we've worked virtually most of the year, I've really made great friends out of my coworkers. And I think that's, like I said, not something I would have if I was just doing a normal active duty spot. Mitch, anything on the partnership piece that you're going to take uh, for the, you know, if, as you develop and grow in, in your Air Force career? Yes, sir. So obviously we've been in the F-35 role right now. And sure, there's some negotiation and, and scrutinization or whatever right now for the F-35 so that's, you know, above us. But I can honestly say for the partnership, the employees that are at the level we're at come to work every day knowing that that flight line matters, knowing that we need F-35s for any kind of uh, potential uh, uh, action. I'm trying to think I'll say that right without conflict. Any potential conflict will probably require fifth generation aircraft. My teammates know that. So I take that away. I take away the, the people I work for uh, in the Kef cell. It's an engineer by trait, never wore the uniform. But uh, Mo ha Hashmir, uh, Mohammed Hashmir, very brilliant engineer, multiple uh, degrees, an MBA, and I watch how he manages people. 
And you can see a, a man like that's probably going to climb the rank structure. Uh, so it's nice to know that somebody that actually cares and puts that much effort to try to m make our sustainment efforts better on, in the field, uh, that makes me, makes me feel satisfied and confident with my peek behind the curtain, if you will. Well, let me ask you this. Um, maybe when I was in uniform, I heard this a lot, um, that in, when you go to industry, they're only interested in the bottom line, uh, you know, and, and they don't really care about necessarily the, the services or the mission. Have you found that? No, sir. I, I found we care about the mission 100%. Now, if you talk about bottom line, I think everyone on our team is, again, while I'm a fan of the Agile organization, everybody knows what your priorities are and, and what you want. Everyone on our team is invested in Lockheed Martin um, emotionally and mentally. So they know if they don't perform, if there's F-35 problems, what's future business for Lockheed Martin? So where bottom line might matter, they know that they owe us a good product, the warfighter a good product. And I watch people work work their tails off to try to get that product up to where it needs to be. Sounds to me like what you're hear what I'm hearing is that the customer value, the product that you deliver will drive the business. So focus on the customer first and the business will come second. I think that's the assumption most of my teammates make and that's the observation I have. Yes, sir. Kara? I would absolutely agree with that. We are striving when we reach back to the flight line every day, how can we make this better for you? So while we do have financials to stick to, um, it's not the driving factor every single day. So let me ask, uh, you know, you brought it up in the virtual environment. Uh, how has that gone for you? I mean, have you found that to be a limiter for, for being able to be effective in, in the operations? It definitely adds some barriers, but it's not something we can't work past. Um, I think it's actually helped me grow as an officer because you really have to um, make, make some phone calls, reach out to people that you've never met face to face. And that's something that I'll have to do on the Air Force. You know, I'm calling across the globe um, for somebody to reach out to. This has really helped practice that. <laughs> do, do you think that, uh, that time, you know, sometimes you hear a nine to five and don't talk to me outside that nine to five, is, is that been something that you've run into here? Not at all. I mean, everybody should obviously respect their off time, but if something needs to be done, we have a dedicated team here. There is 24-7 operations, and the Lockheed team will make sure it gets done, and that's something Mitch and I are used to. Um, when we do wear the uniform, it's a 24-7 job. So if I do get a call at 10 p.m. and it's to take care of the, a person or a mission, I'm on it, and that's what we do. And I feel that mentality at Lockheed while people are also, you know, respecting that you have to have your personal time, too. Good. Mitch, any, any virtual uh, barriers to your operation and work? I think virtual made us have to work harder, to be honest. Made you, so some advice some of the active duty mentors gave us before starting this program, at least for me, was be that metaphorical sponge. Learn as much as you can, shake and move, meet people, you know, talk to them, go to their cube, shake hands, whatever. There's no cubes. <laughs> There's none of that. So being able to where it may have slowed me down, I feel like I didn't hit the ground running till probably three or four months into the fellowship. It made me, like you said, develop as an officer because you had to think critically outside the box while managing everything else. And I think I've been able to see from a corporate world, your program management does not fall in virtual. Everything still gets done, especially when there's sprint planning and scrum management. Operational management, that could be tough because the human element always matters most. As my teammates know, our maintainers matter most. Just the one time we went in for that meeting, you said an antidote about something that came out in the 21X career field. And I was like, man, that's something we wouldn't have gotten on a virtual call because you have the headset and you're waiting to be next to speak. Mm -hmm. So you definitely miss some of that. But hands down, this fellowship has still allowed me to develop in ways I wouldn't have developed with another year in the flight line, even though I've been mostly uh, virtual. So I can only imagine what it would be without being virtual. <laughs> I want to pick up on something you said, because I think it's very important, where uh, the advice was to be a sponge. Uh, I, I think what I would tell you is if you're a sponge, you're going to miss the program. You have to be engaged, you have to be active, and, and you have to give as much into the program if you're going to get out as much. And I, I wonder if you'd like to comment on that one because I don't think that's a fair analogy that you need in the way you need to operate in this program. So, Sarah, did you make the analogy accurate? I, I think how we need to phrase it and how I'll recommend it to anybody, now that you have me thinking about it, be one of those uh, cleaning devices that's got two edges. Be a sponge on one end where you're soaking it up, but then be that harder bristle on the other end where you're able to actually get after some of the cleaning actions. Because once I learn, hey, I developed as a leader, hey, Captain Prisbaki now understands Agile, 
I also had to be shaken and moving, which of course builds those muscle memory, uh, brain cell, uh, putting forth energy. Uh, but the Kef cell, I was having to brief my projects in our scrum meetings. We had to see where I was going and what I was working on. And I had to pull levers, figure out what Slickum I'm calling, who am I emailing from the engineering team. So I'd say the sponge, yes, sir, is half of it. You, you got to be diverse because you definitely need to learn or, or, or you miss the mark. But if you're only learning and sitting back just watching, you won't do. And you'll miss especially such a quick fellowship as this. So it's got to be that two-sided cleaning device. Fair enough. It's absolutely a two-way street. I'm here to learn from Lockheed, but hopefully my teammates are taking stuff away from me as well. Oh, I know they are. <laughs> I know they are. I'll, I'll tell this story from the last class. Uh, we'll have a, a going away ceremony for y'all, much like you would do at any squadron or, or any unit. And uh, unfortunately, though, we have to do it over Zoom in, in today's world. But what I saw was the tears in the eyes of both the EWE officers and the Lockheed Martin folks, teammates that they got to enjoy. The, the going away was no different from this program as it was from a unit uh, in, the, in the Air Force. And it really was remarkable for me to watch that emotional connection, emotional bond that has happened in the growth of that team over the years that you were here. So Bruce, on that topic, are there any other reasons you would want to have EWE fellows around? <laughs> well, so uh, just so you know how this program got started, I, I got a call by a, an Air Force General Officer. We hadn't had an EWE program at Lockheed Aeronautics for, for nearly 20 years. And as soon as it was asked if we would take an EWE program, I immediately said yes. And the reason being is, um, I loved my time in the Air Force. I wouldn't trade any of my time. It was wonderful. Every assignment, the people, the mission, it was great. And then when I moved to Lockheed, I found out that, you know, this is pretty great too. And the people are, are really good. And, and the cultures may be a little bit different, but the heart and the defense of our nation and the security of what we need to do, they're the same. But we didn't work really well together. I mean, there's a friction, there's a, a, a distancing, there's this uh, a little bit of trust that needs to, to be overcome. And what I felt with the EWE program was, is that I knew the folks that we had here and what they were focused on. And, if, and the more officers that we can bring in to see that, to feel it, to believe it, the more that trust bank will get built up and the more that we can be able to build together. And when I use the word partnership, I want to be able to see the ideal government industry partnership because together the strengths will be absolutely unstoppable, unbeatable, and we can defeat anything, anytime, anyplace. And so by bringing in uh, you know, the EWE program and at the young, uh, what I'll call relatively young officer development time, you can grow up now and have that experience. And the more that you, that you grow up and the more that you responsibilities you have and the more rank that you achieve, you can then start educating and helping to say, it's not about us and them, it's about what we can do together. And so I was thrilled when uh, it was Linda Hurry called me and, and asked me if we would start this program. And, and I, I can't see us doing it without it in the future. So. I think you're setting the standard for that. So thanks for asking that question. You know, what I found about uh, PCSing or anytime you went to a, a new base, it was always kind of apprehension about how it was going to go and, and how it was going to work. And, and I know that we had a sponsor for you, Jason Pierce. So uh, tell me about how that went, the, the ability to come in, transition in, and, and how Jason helped you uh, acclimate into the workforce. Absolutely, just like a sponsorship program, Jason was there for us as our functional coordinator. So not only making sure we had everything we needed day one, but really helping us as we navigated through the sustainment operations. Um, it felt honestly maybe even smoother than a normal PCS because we had so many people willing to help us, reaching out, making sure we had the right clearances for everything, had a computer ready to go. So everybody here has been super helpful, especially Jason on day one. Can't say enough what Jason Pierce uh, means to, to us and basically all the challenges we talked about with the virtual and how we had to shake and move and not be just a sitting back sponge, Jason makes that happen. Jason's the lever. Uh, so as far as 
the struggles of a PCS there, what, what I found unique, especially with me, with the family, with a wife and, and daughter at home, my, my daughter's 19 months old. We didn't have that base network. You didn't have a bunch of CGLs or the other maintenance officers. Hey, what's going on? So being out uh, on your own, if you will, one of the very cool aspects of the EWE program, we had the ability to go see the grassy knoll and just live in Fort Worth, Texas. I mean, how often do you get to do that on active duty Air Force? So one of the other reasons I'd apply for the program. But Jason was able to be that continuity. If you need something, you could trust him. Even when we had the record-setting snowstorm here in, in, in the Fort Worth area, who texted me to see if we needed anything? Jason Pierce did. And I want to highlight, even though we have more than half our team wearing a uniform, Jason never did. Jason's completely industry, completely a professional that climbs the ranks of, of a, the corporate world, and he still appreciates our service, and we're able to learn from him, sort of like the other companies that don't have as much a military affiliation like our, uh, some of the other fellows. We're able to learn from Jason and how he interacts just as a professional and a human being. It's just so nice to come to a company, and even though we are, feel like an outsider maybe coming into this, day one, we don't feel that way at all. Felt super welcomed and super helped. Oh, that's great. So, uh, is there anything that you would say is a memorable moment over your time here? Absolutely. I mean, every day I feel like I learn something and talk to somebody new and it's exciting, but we recently took a site visit to Nellis Air Force Base and just really getting where the rubber meets the road or where it meets the flight line um, and seeing that action because we've been so removed from active duty Air Force these past seven months, watching the work that we do how it impacts the field was great and making those connections out there, not only talking to the Lockheed Martin reps, but the, the uniform wearers still. So looking back at the memorable moments, it's again with Jason Pierce. It was day one actually when he took us on the, the flight, uh, excuse me, the production line. Now not just because of the ooh and ah aspect of wow, this is where the world's most advanced fighter jet is made right here in Texas. It was the fact that he was able to talk about, hey, back in World War II, three B-24 Liberators were pushed out of here a day. And my knees started shaking because my grandfather was a navigator on those. And it reminded me of everything you've read in a history book that the industrial might of the U.S. was one of the key reasons we were able to win that war against peer competition with our, the Axis powers. So seeing Jason say that and, and sort of shaking in my bones there as I stood there, remembering we're standing on the shoulders of giants, the partnership of industry, to go back to the partnership we've talked about, is how we're going to get business done. So somebody wants to talk cost or whatever, we got to figure that out, but it's a partnership. I know the men and women here believe it, and everyone putting, they're sweating on that, on that production line, putting the F-35 together on the assembly line, they believe in what they're working for. So um, in terms of access to leadership, do you feel that you've gotten what I would consider exposure to different levels of leadership in the, in the company? I would absolutely say so. I mean, obviously having conversations like this one with you, Bruce, um, and all the other phone calls we've been able to tap into, something equivalent of like a wing level to MAGCOM level conversations that we are exposed to. Sometimes, you know, we sit there, be quiet, but sometimes we're encouraged to ask questions, offer our opinions. And as a junior captain in the Air Force, having those conversations and somebody valuing my opinion, um, it's just been, you know, it's been humbling, but also like really cool. <laughs> Uh, I will say from my experience as a senior officer, uh, what I've found is, is that the more experiences that I drew upon, and, and, and as the ultimate commander of the Air Force Sustainment Center, I had to draw on my entire career, whether it's what I learned as a captain or a lieutenant, a major, whatever. So, so when you when, talk about the career broadening uh, selection process, why did you think about career broadening, and then why did you select for the EWE program? So being that junior captain level, it was about the time to apply for career broadening. So as Mitch mentioned, there's the speed guide that comes out every year. So every year there's an opportunity to do EWE. Maybe if it's not this year for somebody, it could be your year next year. Um, and knowing about the programs, I was blessed to have great mentors who explained to me what EWE was. And it was number one, top of the rack. It's what I wanted to do for my career broadening experience. Um, finding out a few months later that I was selected, you're able to actually see what companies are options and able to say, hey, Lockheed Martin, that sounds great. F-35 program, that's where I want to be and list those. And you get to talk with your assignments team about what's a great place for you to go. Great. Yeah, and, and likewise, it was that part of the career. Mentors had said you need broadening, what's big out there. And I had been pretty much uh, interested with LOA because, excuse me, interested with EWI because of the LOA symposium a few years back. 
I saw my friend who was the maintenance officer at working at Delta and just her lessons learned for fleet management, I thought could apply directly to how I managed my AFSOC fleet where you needed green aircraft on the ramp to go do your mission if you were called upon. Um, so I would definitely foot stomp it. Uh, also keep hoping to educate commanders out there that push this program to your um, subordinates. You know, I did have one mentor when I, when I told her I applied for this. She said, well, hey, I think LCBP is sort of the, the golden ticket. A couple weeks, couple months go by, we're on a call with the career field where they talked about it. I believe it might have been General Hurry saying she was excited for the EWE program and how we're expanding it into 21X world. And uh, the mentor reached back to me and said, oh, I hope you get picked up for EWE now. And, you know, pretty, pretty lucky. Uh, you know, you leave the Air Force, but it definitely Lockheed Martin, you don't, you don't leave the warfighter. So it's been a blessing all around. I think you, uh, when you talk about, uh, when I listen to you and talk about why you selected the UE program, it sounds to me, uh, and, and I can resonate with this, that you are trying to take charge of your career. In other words, I think that there's, uh, no one cares more about your career, I believe, than, than the individual, and that you are faced with choices. And when you are faced with those choices, make one, rather than the system uh, choosing for you. And, and so I was wondering if, if, in thinking of the future, are there goals or aspirations that you may have that you're trying to achieve? And, and I don't necessarily mean rank, but you know, when you look at your future of your Air Force career, what, what would be you know, your ideal of what you would want to make happen? I really just want to continue to grow as a person and not just as an officer. Like I said, I've learned so much about um, kind of growing up in industry and what that looks like here. And so this is just a new experience to kind of add to my bucket of tools. Um, I want to continue to like serve my country and, and help the airmen around me. And that's what really drives me day to day. Like you mentioned, Bruce, it's not always about rank. I just want to continue to, to be a great officer and, and serve the nation. Mitch, have you thought about the future? Yes, sir. So the f future, uh, kind of like you alluded to, as you climbed to the very senior leader level, you draw, drew back on your past experiences. And so when you ask that question, you know, career, the young career I've had so far starts flashing before my eyes, you know, did I develop as, as a leader in person in Afghanistan with, with G-Series orders as a pretty young captain? Yes. Uh, what do you put in that toolbox to take back to you? And that was a big aspect of why I wanted Iwi. Besides, hey, you're getting your career broadening to try to take care of your career. I wanted to learn something different from industry to actually apply it as a leader. I've talked about scrum management for, hey, maybe an operational level type thing with the Agile organization, but ultimately I wanted to figure out how to better take care of my people. Um, I know uh, the close goal might be squadron command. That probably won't be the last if you look at the lifetime of a career, office, a career maintenance officer, but if I could be a squadron commander, if, if the Air Force blesses me with that, I'd like to be able to try to take care of people in a way where they feel included and like they value to the team like I'm able to see the, the industry world do. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff going on in our career field right now. I think it's the Airman First Initiative out of Aviano, but I do believe Lockheed Martin, especially the Agile Sales, put their teammates uh, first. What do you need? I mean, I told you Jason Pierce texted us during the storm. So ultimately want to be a career uh, maintenance officer, sir. Want to be a squadron commander where I can take these lessons learned, but now that's the answer I would have given you six months ago, and it's still the answer, but it's starting to morph a little bit with the whole accelerate, change, or lose uh, coming all the way from the top. And I think IWI is the perfect pool of leaders because we have all, all ranks. We have some enlisted, some officers, some uh, civilian airmen, GS-type employees, but we're the pool of how do you accelerate that change. So everybody talked about that in some way, shape, or form in our mid-tour brief. It's probably going to be in most of our papers. I know my team's name is Adapt or Die off the movie Moneyball where they took new uh, managerial uh, uh, processes to a roster in baseball, and it actually worked for them. They used a computer, go figure. But that accelerate change or lose is something where I think we both can build off Iwi if we never lose this momentum. And that, that's the challenge, right? But how do you get deliberate placement back after Iwi? And how do you keep not just, hey, the leading people as a squadron commander lessons learned, but, you know, what can we do to keep the F-35 flying? How are we changing processes or bringing improvement? So whether it's staff, whether it's command, whatever, I want to be able to help foster change to improve. So let's talk about sustainment and maintenance at the flight line and, uh, and the fact that that's usually thought of as a manual intensive, uh, I, I will call it hard work kind of effort. Have you seen the adaptation of, of digital technology, of the ability to bring in 
uh, what I would call advanced algorithms or analytics into your, into your work areas to help the folks in the field? To answer your question, most of the leaders at the tactical level know we need to change. They need to take advantage of these algorithms and letting uh, automated uh, technology do sort of maintenance decisions for us. But unfortunately, people are always change resistance. I had a, a, a chief tell me that when I was a young lieutenant, hey, change is the only constant in life, but people always resist it, right? So how do we go up against change when the top direction is to foster change, right? Don't change for the sake of change, but change to get better. And I think our maintenance units are sort of set up where they're not able to absorb these sort of changes right now. So that's part of my thesis paper for the adapter die. And there's some maintenance change experiments going on right now in ACC. But ultimately, I'll cite the, the V-22 platform. We knew that our flight control was a swashplate actuator was going to go CBM plus maintenance. Do you know how we found out about that? From the conference with the SPO or, or whoever mattered at MAGCOM level where tactical leaders weren't there and they said, you're going CBM plus. So when I first heard that, I was excited. I saw the CBM plus from an IWI fellow at Delta a few years plus, but then a couple minutes passed, I said, wait a minute, our data input is grossly wrong because we're doing paper forms. We're working IMDS, um, an outdated system. We, we don't have the data to be smart when we are going to R square those or, or make a scheduled R square for a CBM plus a component on the V22 platform. In your area, especially in the keep them flying cell, the whole goal is to be able to make the field, I'll call it more autonomous and self-sufficient. And there's a tool that uh, maybe that I've heard about called vision that has machine learning and, and the more inputs it gets, the smarter it gets to help to the field. I mean, do you find that something to, of the way of the future and, and, and how could that be applicable to the Air Force? Hands down, sir. Uh, so vision is going to help us. One of my observations early on in the KEF was there was a lot of manual enter on some of it. We had a master list. It was an Excel document. And I'm thinking, is this 2001 or is this 2021? Uh, but vision coming online has made it much easier to track, able to see our ARs and just that autonomous thinking for you. Uh, for the Marvel fans, kind of like having Jarvis and your Iron Man, right? Um, the field absolutely needs that kind of uh, help. And especially if you look at our maintainers now or your logisticians in the warehouse, they're, they're not even millennials anymore. They're, I believe, generation Xenio or Z, whatever the next generation is. But younger than millennials, they're born with a cell phone in their hand, right? So how do we help these maintainers help themselves? When I was on the V-22 program, paper forms, IMDS lagging, data integrity was probably my number one focus at the tactical level because I knew we don't set our maintainers up for success. Uh, we expect them to work all day in the Florida heat generating a, a complex aircraft, and it's the this, this same, you put it to any you know, Lockheed Martin platform, F-35, those guys at Luke, they're probably sweating there in Arizona. But the same challenge is you want to be able to make sure you have accurate data and something that can automate it for you. If you take the human element out of it, you can only expand. So the amount of error we, we have and the amount of sometimes you, you get distracted when you're working, it's not good for business because a lot of the jobs we do here at Lockheed Martin, data-driven from the field, so how can Lockheed Martin help the field if that is not right? But then how can the field help themselves? How can we stand on a desk and say, give me funding for this if our data is bad? So ultimately, sir, we have to follow General Brown's uh, action order of accelerate and change or lose on autonomous technology for maintenance. I'm and, a big believer. I, I guess what I would say is, is that you've, you've had an experience what these tools can do to you, for you. How, does, how do we get the Air Force to be early adopters of these tools to help at the flight line level? And, and Kara, I think you've seen the same thing in the, in the mission readiness. I think you've seen uh, uh, robotic process automations help automate. You've seen now we're bringing artificial intelligence to the supply demand process. Anything that you've seen that you go, boy, I wish I could take that with me? I mean, absolutely. Lockheed is able to identify, hey, you know, we're spending a lot of man hours or a lot of dollars doing this. How do we make it faster? And you assign a team and you get it it ready to be automated. And so that's something absolutely the Air Force should be able to jump on. Unfortunately, sometimes it, it's a little bit slower on the, the DOD side with budgeting. Um, so the only way forward is really just having leaders like General Brown acknowledge that we need to change and, and hopefully actually follow through on that. So, so here's uh, what I will offer you is that we wanna share those tools with the Air Force. So you help us figure out how to adopt them and, and we want those tools. And the reason being is those tools are really decision-making tools and help, and, and the more that we can collaborate 
on the data, the more that we can collaborate on what the decisions are, the, the more they'll become common goals. And then part of that partnership, it, they can help us really, I will call it, get that eye lock on what needs to go, to go forward. So let me offer you this. Final comments, anything that you'd like to make sure that the audience knew about your experience, your program, your future, and, and, and just let us know. I mean, it's absolutely a great experience. Um, like I said, when, I was, when it was time to come to career broadening, EWE was what I wanted to do. And the cards just worked out that, that I'm here now. Um, so I'd recommend it to anybody to apply because really I'm, I'm probably one of the junior officers in the program and they looked at my records and I was just the right fit for here now. So just, you know, try it. Um, and then just my team has been great. Um, the leadership's been great and it's really going to be a highlight of my career. Absolutely. Great. It will definitely be the highlight I look back on. Uh, it's funny though, you say that about every assignment, right? I, I, you know, everything's the best assignment. So hopefully, you know, that, that trend can continue. But Iwi uh, definitely has been a, a uh, once in a lifetime opportunity for world-class exposure to, you know, an aerospace industry and our, our industry partner. So if this was the real Lola Symposium, you would probably be here listening to us on stage. You all would see the Iwi booth at the end of the night, but you'd also see Lockheed Martin with their booth. And there's, there's other mentors, people I haven't even worked with uh, in, in Aero here at Fort Worth that I know are retired maintenance officers that work at Lockheed Martin elsewhere worldwide, that I met them through, uh, through the Lowe's Symposium. And, you know, so I just recommend keep reaching out for your network. I think any of the UE fellows, I know I speak for all of us, we want to share our lessons learned. So reach out to us. Um, there's four maintenance captains and maintenance masks are in several, how many supply side? Five officers? We have five LROs. Five LROs. So we definitely want to share our lessons learned. And if you're thinking about it, apply. You have to be self-driven if you're going to be in the virtual world. But when you have guys like Jason Pierce letting you help you get that exposure and actually work and be a valued member of your team, it can be a win. Kara, Mitch, first, thanks for taking the time to have this roundtable with us today. And, and I hope that uh, the audience gets a, a real sense of what this program is all about and how you can make a difference within the program. And I'm going to speak to you for a minute uh, as a retired Air Force officer. You know, one of the things that, that you always hope and pray is that the Air Force is going to grow stronger and be better in the future. And that happens because of leadership. And, and having gotten to know you, having gotten to watch you work, and having gotten to you to see part of this program, I know that the future of the Air Force is bright because we're gonna have leaders grow up uh, through the chain and, and take on bigger and more responsibilities and they're gonna make it better and better and better. And you're gonna, your toolbox of techniques and, and opportunities to make the Air Force better is, is gonna grow. And I, I wanna just tell you, thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your leadership. And more importantly, Thank you for how you're going to make the Air Force better in the future. And I, I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to talk uh, with our EWE officers. And, and I know for myself, I believe that in terms of the partnership, in terms of what we can do as a government and industry team to really support and defend the nation and support and defend our priorities anywhere, any place, any time, it's through the strength of how we work and how we operate together and, and the trust that we develop in one another. And I hope you've heard that through this program is that this is really about learning each other, developing relationships and building upon those relationships to make it better for the Air Force and for Lockheed Martin and for our nation. Thank you for joining us today.